Ever wondered how weight loss actually works? It's more than just counting calories and hitting the gym. We'll break down the nitty gritty of metabolism, the role of nutrition and actual nutrition strategies. But here's the real kicker. Why is it so damn hard to do it? Well, no more guesswork or gimmicks. It's time to understand the how and why behind effective, long-lasting weight loss as this knowledge can be your ultimate tool for achieving better health. Hello, my dears, and welcome. I'm Marina, a registered dietitian with a passion for helping people facing the challenges of obesity and weight loss. Today, we will explore the science of weight loss, where we will uncover valuable knowledge that will give you understanding of how the actual weight loss works. Sure, looking great in a swimsuit is fantastic, but let's go beyond that. To achieve sustainable weight loss, you need to understand how your body functions and how does it all happen. We need to familiarize ourselves with terms like energy expenditure, requirements, energy balance, energy deficit and how to achieve it. By the end of this nutrition crash course, I aim to empower you with practical nutrition strategies and knowledge as it generally serves as the ultimate weight loss weapon. Let's dive right in. Keeping a healthy weight is a balancing act. Before we dive into the critical topics of energy balance, which is the key to weight loss, we need to learn about some nutritional basics as this knowledge will serve as a starting point. What is food? Food can be explained as a mix of substances that we ingest. Essentially, it acts as a fuel station and a provider of vital molecules that makes up our bodies. Food is mainly composed of water, fats, proteins and carbohydrates, along with sprinkles of essential minerals and vitamins. To understand where the energy comes from, we must get down to most basic levels where food is composed of atoms. Food contains a limited variety of atoms, with the main players being carbon, oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen. These atoms bond together to form more complex molecules like glucose and amino acids linked by specialized chemical bonds. As we consume and digest food, the digestive system works like a factory, breaking down these molecules and liberates energy from those chemical bonds. This process is known as metabolism. Metabolism Metabolism is our very own internal chemical lab working 24-7, turning food into energy, building blocks for our bodies and conveniently disposing of waste. Everyone's metabolism is unique like a metabolic fingerprint. Term metabolism essentially refers to all physical and chemical processes in the body that change food into energy. Energy and calories. The energy provided by food is officially quantified in joules and kilojoules, yet kilocalories or simply calories are more frequently used. Within the European Union, both kilocalorie and kilojoule are used on nutritional labels as one calorie equals 4.1868 joules. And remember, calories aren't the enemy. We need them to live. Calories are simply a measure of energy found in food and not the tiny creatures in your closet that make your clothes tighter. If we understand the concept of calories, we can become more aware of the energy content of different foods and beverages. Hate it or love it, calories do count when it comes to weight loss, but it isn't a must to count them. Nutrients Nutrients, the VIPs of our meals, are the source of energy or calories, but also source of substances that promote growth, maintenance, repair and more. Let's spotlight their energy providing role. Six key nutrients need to be ingested through food as our body cannot produce them adequately or at all. They are carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, and water. 
the bulk of food weight is made up of carbohydrates, fats, proteins and water, whereas vitamins and minerals constitute only a small fraction of that weight. Based on the amounts of nutrients in food, we categorize them into categories such as macronutrients and micronutrients. The energy and building blocks for our bodies come from macronutrients, which are protein, carbs and fats, while micronutrients, which are minerals and vitamins, although essential, don't provide energy, but are important for overall health. Macronutrients Our macros vary across foods. Think lean meats for protein, fruits and rice for carbs, avocado for fats. Of course, there are also foods that contain two or all three macronutrients at once, such as egg, which is a combination of protein and fats. For energy intake calculations, we use the calorie table of foods, which was designed by American scientist Wilbur Atwater. Atwater's model states that each macronutrient packs a unique energy punch. Fats are the king with 9 calories per gram, while proteins and carbs offer 4 calories per gram. Fibers were assumed to contain no energy because they are indigestible, and the dark horse of the pack, alcohol, providing 7 calories per gram, though it's not exactly a health food, but it's a fun food indeed. Energy in food example, egg. Let's decode that energy in an everyday food item. The humble egg. A large egg holds around 6 to 7 grams of protein. Multiply that by 4, remember mathematics, and you get 24 to 28 calories from protein. Add around 5 grams of fat, which yields 45 calories, and voila! An egg is roughly 70 calories in total. Energy and nutrient density. This calculation allows us to determine the energy density of any food item referring to the number of calories per volume of food. The same calculation can be used for any food. Don't be fooled, high energy doesn't always mean high nutrition. The nutrient density, which is the ratio of beneficial ingredients to calories, is equally important. As a simple rule, foods with high water content and a modest number of carbohydrates, such as fruit and vegetables, are typically low in calories but nutrient-rich. That's your mom's wisdom confirmed scientifically. Eat your fruits and veggies. Basal metabolic rate. Energy that we get from food is required by our bodies to live. We need that energy, those calories, to carry out various functions such as breathing, circulating blood, synthesizing new cells and repairing damaged tissues. On top of that, we need energy for moving, thinking, doing different activities, etc. Even at rest, our bodies require energy to maintain essential processes commonly known as basal metabolic rate or BMR. BMR represents the minimum amount of energy we need, even if we don't leave our tushes off the couch all day. And of course, we need more than that. Total daily energy expenditure. The number of calories individual needs in a day is called total daily energy expenditure, or TDEE. TDEE can vary significantly based on various factors including age, sex, weight, height, activity levels and metabolism. TDEE consists of multiple factors – BMR, NEAT, exercise and physical activity and TEF. Let's decode all of that. TDEE and BMR Basal metabolic rate forms the foundation for estimating daily caloric requirements as it accounts for the larger portion of TDEE, typically around 60 to 75 percent. Age, sex, body composition and genetics are the primary factors influencing BMR. It generally decreases with age due to decline in muscle mass and a decrease in metabolic activity.
This means that older individuals may require fewer calories to maintain their weight compared to younger individuals. It's sad, I know. Sex is also important. Men typically have higher BMR compared to women due to a higher percentage of muscle mass and generally larger body size. As a result, men often require more calories to sustain their metabolic needs. Ladies, I'm all for gender equality, but when it comes to calorie consumption, it seems men are winning in the higher metabolism game, leaving us women with smaller portions and bigger dreams. Affecting our TDEE is also our body composition. Lean muscle mass is more metabolically active than fat tissue. Therefore, individuals with a higher proportion of muscle mass tend to have a higher BMR and require more calories. Of course, there are some medical problems such as thyroid disorders, hormonal imbalances, eating disorders, chronic diseases, etc. that can affect TDEE. TDEE and NEAT Moving on to NEAT another factor that contributes to total daily energy expenditure. It refers to the energy expended during all activities other than former exercise or physical activity. It includes routine tasks such as walking, standing, fidgeting and general movement throughout the day. NEAT can account for approximately 15 to 30% of TDEE and varies among individuals based on occupation, lifestyle and personal habits. TDEE and physical activity. Then there's planned exercise sessions and other physical activities. The contribution of exercise to total daily energy expenditure varies depending on the intensity, duration and frequency of the exercise performed. The energy expenditure from exercise can be a significant component of TDEE for individuals who engage in a regular physical activity, but also keep in mind, we often overestimate energy expenditure during exercise and sometimes increase in need with those small daily spikes in everyday activities can contribute more to TDEE than plan activity twice a week. TDEE and TEF. And lastly, there is TEF, which stands for thermic effect of the food. It represents the energy expenditure associated with the digestion, absorption and storage of ingested food. On average, TEF accounts for up to 10% of total energy expenditure, but it's unique to each person. That's why we often leave it out of the questions and equations when we try to determine our TDEE. Calculating TDEE so, by combining these components, you can estimate your total daily energy expenditure. BMR can be estimated using various equations such as the Harris-Benedict equation or the mifflin senior equation, which is more suitable for overweight individuals. These equations take into account factors like age, sex, weight, and height. However, it's important to know that these equations provide estimations and individual variations exist. Once you calculate your BMR, you multiply this number by a physical activity level factor based on your activity level. One could use standardized activity tables for that estimation. The resulting number will give you an estimation of your total daily caloric needs. But of course, you can skip all that as numerous online tools and websites are available to assist you in calculating your total daily energy expenditure. You can use calorie calculators like the Body Weight Planner from the National Institute of Health or Calculator.net, which I use for all my quick estimations. And although it's an estimation, it's good enough. Energy Intake Recommendation if you don't want calculus hustle, here are the average numbers. 
European Dietary Guidelines based on the European Food Safety Authority Agency, EFSA, recommend a daily calorie intake of approximately 2,300 to 2,600 calories for adult men and 1,800 to 2,000 calories for adult women. Keep in mind that individual needs vary based on factors such as age, body size and activity levels. For example, very active, young and tall women may need more energy than sedentary, smaller, older gentlemen. Energy balance and energy deficit. And finally, we've arrived to the most important thing, energy balance. The concept of energy balance is vital for weight loss. It is the fundamental principle that highlights the necessity of creating an energy deficit when then leads to weight loss. The concept of energy balance is based on the thermodynamic principle that energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be gained, lost or stored by an organism as it cannot disappear or magically appear from nowhere. A fundamental principle of nutrition and metabolism is that body weight change is associated with an imbalance between energy content of food eaten and energy expanded by the body to maintain life and to perform physical work. When energy intake from food equals energy expenditure, we achieve a state of energy balance. It is essentially the relationship between energy in and energy out. In meaning the number of calories eaten and out meaning number of calories used. When the body is in energy balance, body weight is stable. But even small and persistent deviation from energy balance must result in changes in body energy stores and consequent changes in body weight over time. Variability and weight change across the human population, however, is extremely diverse. Some individuals are more prone to gain or lose considerable weight even in shorter periods of time than others who can more easily maintain their body weight even over the course of an entire lifetime. There is a lot of evidence that suggests that it's more difficult to maintain energy balance in today's modern environment than it was in the past, but nevertheless, changes in energy balance cause changes in body mass. Positive energy balance. Based on the principles of energy homeostasis, weight gain can be achieved only with a persistent state of positive energy balance. A positive energy balance or energy surplus is where energy intake exceeds energy expenditure and causes weight gain. That extra energy is stored in an adipose tissue in our fat cells, so up to 80% of the cases, this gain is in body fat. In other words, if you eat it, you must use it or you will store it. Hence, overweight and obesity. Obesity. Obesity is defined as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that may impair health. That extra cushion is not an aesthetic problem. Adipose tissue is fully recognized as a metabolically active organ. While it is the primary site for energy storage in the form of lipids, it is also a major endocrine organ producing and secreting adipose tissue-specific hormones known as adipokines. Adipokines are cell-signaling molecules also known as cytokines produced by the adipose tissue that play functional roles in metabolic status of the body and are enhancing inflammation, insulin resistance, etc. Obesity really is essentially a complex disease associated with an increase in several inflammatory markers leading to chronic low-grade inflammation. Accordingly, People who are overweight or obese have increased risk for many serious diseases and health conditions such as higher mortality, hypertension, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease and stroke, many types of cancer, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, mental illnesses and low quality of life. 
it is undeniable that obesity is bad for our health. But there are clearly differences between individuals in the extent to which it is bad. We will cover that in another video. Negative energy balance or calorie deficit. Moving on from the positive energy balance to negative, which in our case is a good thing for weight loss. Negative energy balance occurs when energy expenditure exceeds intake and causes weight loss or body mass loss. In other words, weight loss will follow if you consume less calories than you use. This is called a calorie deficit and it's the holy grail of weight loss. When we take in less energy than the body needs overall, it turns to stored fat reserves for energy. We often hear that we need to burn fat for weight loss. We are not actually burning anything. This is quite complex physiological process and it's called adipose tissue lipolysis where our body breaks down triglyceride stores in fat cells and release them into the bloodstream in the form of fatty acids and that can be turned into energy in the tissues that need energy. Where does the fat go? When our body loses fat, fat cells don't disappear. They stay right there, they just shrink in size. So we don't actually lose fat, rather we empty our fat cells. So when we lose weight, or better said, lose fat, this fat is converted to energy with end byproducts such as water and carbon dioxide. So in terms of where does the fat go? To the energy we don't see but use, and end byproducts where we pee it, sweat it and exhale it. But what we do see are the benefits. Benefits of weight loss. Weight loss of only 3 to 5% that is maintained has the ability to produce clinically relevant health improvements. Even larger weight loss reduces additional risk factors for CVD and type 2 diabetes. Goal of weight loss of 5 to 10% within 6 months is recommended. How big of a calorie deficit? Calorie deficit can be achieved in many different ways. Every diet for weight loss known to mankind is based on a calorie deficit, regardless if it's mentioned or not. Some create a deficit by banning certain high-calorie foods, others eliminate a whole group of macronutrients or special food groups, and others limit the time frame within which we eat, and so on. But the results in weight loss are all based on calorie deficit with different nutritional strategies. Sure, obesity is not just the calories in and calories out. It's a complex set of interactions among genetic, behavioral, and environmental factors. But if we want to lose weight, we have to achieve this calorie deficit. Research findings suggest that a caloric deficit around 300 to 750 calories per day is commonly recommended for sustainable weight loss. If we talk about percentage, we could say that around 10 to 20% of a calorie reduction from your total daily energy expenditure should be good enough for initial weight loss. Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics state in their position that an energy deficit of approximately 500 to 750 calories a day can be advised to patients seeking weight loss. However, it is crucial to recognize that individual requirements and circumstances can vary significantly, and that's why that number is a spectrum. Factors such as sex, height, starting weight, as well as the necessary dietary and behavioral changes required to establish a deficit all contribute to the unique nature of each person's weight loss journey. As the Academy states, during weight loss, a registered dietitian should prescribe an individual diet, including patient's preferences and health status, to achieve and maintain adequacy of the diet and reduce caloric intake. To determine the appropriate caloric deficit, it is essential to first understand your maintenance calorie, which is your TDEE covered earlier. By calculating this baseline, one can then extract the necessary 
500 calories or 10 to 20 percent of those calories to create a caloric deficit. For most people, a calorie deficit of 500 calories per day is sufficient for weight loss and unlikely to significantly affect your hunger or energy levels. As we mentioned earlier, there are numbers of online calculators to help you with this estimation, but you can also use another method which I would highly recommend. Tracking your current calorie intake and wait for a week or two, and then getting a more precise number from where you then subtract chosen amount of calories for a deficit. To shed approximately one kilogram of fat, it is necessary to generate around 8,000 calorie deficit over a specific period. Certainly, that is a simplified rule of thumb, but it may not always hold true for everyone as the rate of weight loss is influenced by several different factors. I also must add that if you have a substantial amount of weight to lose, it is wise not to start with too big of a deficit because in the process you will have to adjust calories even lower because of the metabolic adaptation that occurs down the road. As you lose weight, your maintenance level numbers will drop because you will weigh less and therefore you will need to further your deficit to continue losing weight. We will cover this later on, but for now, don't go too low with your calories in the beginning of the process. Another why you should aim for rather smaller than bigger deficit is because it can be more sustainable in the long run. Unfortunately, many people know how to lose weight and also lose it quickly, but what we struggle with is sustaining that weight loss story for another time, but if you reduce your caloric intake more slowly, you give yourself enough time to get used to the necessary dietary and other behavioral changes that will allow you to maintain them in the long term. On the other hand, there are people perfectly capable of greater reductions in calorie deficit and are also successful with more aggressive weight loss approach. Some people tolerate bigger changes better or even need to lose weight quickly because of the health emergency. It all depends on the individual preferences and needs. Go slow or a bit quicker. Just go. To create a calorie deficit, one must focus on two primary aspects. Reducing caloric intake and also increasing energy expenditure. It is possible to do one or the other, but creating calorie deficit through increasing energy expenditure alone is extremely difficult because it requires a tremendous amount of effort and we usually overestimate how much energy we burn during exercise. So, it is more sustainable to create a calorie deficit through a diet with reducing calorie intake and exercising because of other benefits that will also help with weight loss. Counting calories. When it comes to reducing calorie intake and calorie talk, we stumble upon first dilemma. To count or not to count. The debate on counting calories can be seen from two sides of the same coin. Yes and no. Let's begin with the positive side. Calorie counting can enhance awareness of food intake, allowing for informed choices about portion sizes and food selection. It promotes accountability, making us more conscious of our eating habits and potentially reducing mindless eating. Calorie counting also provides an educational opportunity, helping us understand the calorie content of different foods and supporting the development of healthier dietary habits. Tracking calories for a period of time can help identify eating patterns that require mindful attention. Now, let's discuss the negative aspects. It is crucial to emphasize that calorie counting is not suitable for individuals with a history of eating disorders or those with obsessive personalities. In those individuals, engaging in calorie counting may exaggerate obsessive behaviors, create an unhealthy relationship with food, and contribute to the development of disordered eating patterns. It is important to ensure that individuals facing these difficulties do not engage in calorie counting without proper guidance or at all. 
Other drawbacks to counting calories include the time-consuming and sometimes tedious nature of the process as it requires effort to measure and record meals accurately. Additionally, counting calories relies on databases and estimates which may not always be accurate. There is also a risk of becoming overly focused on calorie numbers, disregarding the significance of essential nutrients and food quality, which is also very important. Moreover, if an individual has a significant amount of weight to lose and poor eating habits, simply shifting towards a diet rich in high protein and high fiber food may be sufficient, rendering calorie counting unnecessary. While calorie counting is not for everyone and not essential, it can be a useful tool that works in our favor when used appropriately. And that is all that it is, a tool and a data, and not an indicator of one's word or feelings. Also, for majority of people, it is not meant to be a lifelong practice, but periodic periods of tracking can be beneficial, especially considering our tendency to underestimate the calorie content of certain foods. If counting calories does not align with your preferences or you find yourself in the no-no section, do not count them. But they do count, so you will have to reduce your calorie intake in order to lose weight. Importance of balanced diet. Of course, we must add, calories are the king, but the nutrients are the queen. And you know the saying, behind every successful man, there is a woman. So even if the calories in versus calorie out is the foundation of weight loss, the quality of the calories you consume and the types of calories you burn also play a significant role in determining the overall effectiveness health, and sustainability of your weight loss efforts. When comparing foods, an equal number of calories does not mean that the foods will affect the body in the same way. For example, if one's diet consists solely of sugars and refined carbohydrates without adequate intake of protein and fiber, huge rises in blood sugars will result, leading to increased insulin spikes possible increased fat storage, and also unstable energy levels and poor satiety. Your diet should be balanced to be healthy. A healthy diet is varied diet rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grain products and high quality proteins, and poor in added sugars, refined grains, and highly processed foods. It provides adequate amount of various nutrients to maintain health and well-being, such as protein, carbohydrate, fat, vitamins, minerals and water, where each nutrient has a particular function in the human body. Counting calories or not, it is important to change your eating habits and implement nutrition strategies to reduce your caloric intake in order to lose weight. Let's look at some of them. Calorie Deficit Strategies Reducing calories from your diet doesn't always require major changes. There are several strategies that can help you reduce caloric intake, which can lead to weight loss. You can start with just one and then gradually add others as you master first. But those strategies are not just the weight loss tools. They are in fact the basics of a healthy diet. Sometimes we think we need to have some extra new fancy diet, but the old school advices work, but only if you work them long enough. Moving on to the strategies for reducing caloric intake, but first a quick disclaimer. The following are common dietary approaches utilized for obesity interventions. They are not rigid plans to be followed as individual needs, preferences and health statuses vary among individuals. Liquid calories. The most important and overlooked one is to not drink your calories. Sugar-sweetened beverages are a major source of added sugars in the diet. A robust body of evidence has linked habitual intakes of sugar-sweetened beverages with weight gain and a higher risk compared with infrequent sugar-sweetened beverages consumption of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and some cancers, which makes these beverages a clear target for policy and regulatory actions. 
swapping sugar-sweetened beverages for non-caloric drink such as water, unsweetened teas or other calorie-free beverages can significantly reduce calorie intake. If you're not used to drinking water and drink a lot of sodas, this simple swap with zero non-caloric options can make a whole deficit for you. So start there. Those are small food-based changes that can be easier to make in the beginning as the larger behavior changes, such as changing macronutrient composition of a diet. Highly processed foods. First, a quick disclaimer. Nearly all of our food is processed to an extent. For example, pickled veggies, flour, yogurt, you get the picture. So it's important to know that just because the food is processed, it is not bad. But there are some highly processed foods, we also call them junk foods, fast foods, and sometimes comfort foods. These foods are usually high in calories, low in essential nutrients such as fiber, protein, and high in sugar, salt, and fat. Think cakes, burgers, chocolate, chips, ice cream, you know the goodies. Those foods are super palatable, meaning they are delicious and therefore sometimes irresistible to eat as they can override our ability to control the amount we eat. They are also commonly purchased in large portion sizes, which additionally contributes to excessive energy intake. So it is important to reduce the amount and the frequency of eating such foods. Recent research provides fairly consistent support for the association of ultra-processed food intake with obesity and related cardiometabolic outcomes. But if we deem those foods as bad and eliminate them altogether, we can feel deprived, which can lead to all or nothing mentality and restricting and binging cycle. Instead, it's good to prioritize whole foods and minimize, but not exclude, intake of highly processed ones. So you can have your cake and eat it too, just less often and in smaller portions. But do not keep those foods at home. If they are there, you will eat them. I often advise my clients and myself to have one or two treats a week in moderate amounts. This also allows for eliminating that black and white view of a weight loss diet. Like you eat one cookie and it's all over and then you start on Monday, except it's Monday. <laughs> we know the drill. Specific nutrients. What about specific nutrients? Various dietary plans with different calorie content and macronutrient composition have been assessed and all found to be promising in promoting weight loss in adults. Nevertheless, the optimal diet remains still under debate. Only general principles and recommendations can be provided and no single diet can be prescribed to all people with obesity or recommended as the best fit for all without strict individualization. Various researchers support that you can lose fat regardless of your macronutrient ratio in the long run, as calorie intake matters more. As the one-year-long Diet Fits randomized control trial shows, there were no significant difference in the weight change between a healthy low-fat diet versus healthy low-carbohydrate diet. In the context of these two common weight loss diets approaches, neither of the two couldn't help figure out which diet was better for different people. The best thing to do is to choose foods that will help you adhere to your diet and maintain deficit. So, if you like to eat pasta and don't care for full fat cheeses, okay. You can choose whole grain option in smaller quantity as long as you stay in calorie deficit and this can work for you. It is essential to maintain diet quality using 80-20 rule, so eat whole nutrient-packed food from various groups 80% of the time and 20% of the time you can indulge yourself with some treats. When discussing weight loss diets, the focus is often on cutting back on various foods, but it's crucial to note that the standout nutrient not to reduce is protein. Protein intake 
several studies have suggested that higher protein diets may increase total weight loss and increase the percentage of fat loss. Meta-analysis of studies by Hansen and colleagues concludes that increased protein intake reduces body weight compared to lower protein intakes. Protein is really an essential macronutrient that has a number of properties that make it particularly effective for weight loss. Firstly, it is more satiating than carbohydrates or fats, meaning that it helps to reduce hunger and increase feelings of fullness. This can lead to a spontaneous reduction in calorie intake. Secondly, protein stimulates dietary-induced thermogenesis to a greater extent than other macronutrients. It means that protein requires more energy to digest and metabolize when we eat it compared to fats and carbohydrates. This can help to increase metabolism and burn more calories throughout the day. Finally, protein can help to preserve lean body mass during weight loss. Several clinical trials have found that consuming more protein than the recommended dietary allowance not only reduces body weight, but also enhances body composition by decreasing fat mass and preserving fat-free mass in both low-calorie and in standard-calorie diets. Additionally, high-protein diet not only provides weight loss effects, but can also prevent weight regain after weight loss. It has also not been reported to have adverse effects on health in terms of bone density or renal function in healthy adults. European and American dietary guidelines for adults recommend modest protein intake of 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram of body weight per day or about 10 to 15% of total daily energy expenditure. That intake is quite low. Nutrition societies of Germany, Austria and Switzerland revised those reference values for the intake of protein in 2017, but still, 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. Is that amount actually optimal for weight loss or is it the minimum amount to prevent deficiencies? Over the past 20 years, high-protein diets have been promoted as a successful strategy to prevent or treat obesity through improvements in body weight management. Several meta-analyses of shorter-term, tightly controlled feeding studies showed greater weight loss, fat mass loss, and preservation of lean mass after higher protein energy restrictions diet than after lower protein energy restriction diets. Reduction in triglycerides, blood pressure, and waist circumference were also reported. So, the proper protein intake recommendation during a weight loss process is generally higher than in typical circumstances. A diet can be labeled as a high-protein diet when it surpasses 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day or goes beyond the usual 15-16% of total energy intake. Data suggests that high-protein diets that contain 1.2 to 1.6 gram of protein per kilogram a day and potentially include meal-specific protein quantities of at least 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal provide improvements in appetite, body weight management, cardiometabolic risk factors or all of these health outcomes. Others conclude that even higher and broader range is appropriate and safe. 1.5 to 2.5 grams of protein per kilogram a day, especially when paired with activity to wrap the benefits of sustaining fat-free mass. As in all things in life, it's good to be in the middle and I usually recommend my clients around 1.2 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram a day or around 25 to 30% of total daily energy expenditure. The optimal intake will vary depending on number of factors including age, sex, height, activity level, but it's beneficial to stay in this range. Achieving this higher protein target can be a challenge for some people, so it's crucial to incorporate protein-rich foods into each meal and to not worry about how many grams of protein in each meal.
Just include a good serving of protein-rich foods and when planning your next meal, start by selecting a protein source and then build your meal around it. If you find that one meal is lower in protein, make sure to balance it out by including higher protein options in your other meals. In terms of protein sources, it is better to choose lean proteins. They are generally considered to be more beneficial for weight loss than more fatty protein sources because they tend to be lower in calories and fat, which can help with weight management. For example, a 3.5 ounce or 100 grams of serving or chicken breast contains about 31 grams of protein and only 3 grams of fat, while the same serving of pork belly contains about 27 grams of protein and 23 grams of fat. As 1 gram of fat has 9 calories, that means 180 calories difference between the meats that weighs the same. So you can eat more for less if you choose the leaner option. Excellent options of protein-rich foods are lean meats, fish, seafood, tofu, soy-based products, legumes, eggs, low-fat dairy products, or high-protein vegan substitutes, as well as protein powders like whey and others. In conclusion, protein is an essential macronutrient that can help with weight loss. So try to prioritize it in every meal. High fiber foods. High fiber foods are another big yes. High fiber foods, especially fruits, vegetables, legumes, and also whole grains have been shown to aid in weight loss through several mechanisms. One of the main ways that fiber helps with weight loss is by promoting feelings of fullness and satiety, which can lead to decreased calorie intake. Increased fiber intake is associated with a statistically significant decrease in body weight, body mass index, and waist circumference in obese individuals. It also plays a role in regulating blood sugar levels and insulin sensitivity, which can help prevent overeating and weight gain. High fiber foods also play into the volume eating strategy. And let's not forget the other amazing benefits of high-fiber foods, such as reduced risk of heart disease, diabetes, and certain types of cancer. Oh, and pooping. Fruits and vegetables deserve their own mentioning. Within the context of promoting healthy diets, the increased consumption of fruit and vegetables has gained recognition in large part due to the findings of the DASH diet which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. This diet is recommended for people who want to prevent or treat high blood pressure and reduce the risk of heart disease. It focuses on fruits and vegetables, whole grains and lean meats. Increasing fruits and especially vegetables, is a dietary change that can reduce dietary energy density, enhance satiation, and assist with decreasing overall energy intake, particularly if fruits and vegetables are consumed instead of other foods higher in energy density. If you don't like your veggies, experiment with different cooking methods or you can also add some flavor with different seasoning, sauces, herbs and spices. You can try making them part of a dish that you really like and hide them in it. Volume eating Volume eating refers to a dietary approach that focuses on consuming larger quantities of low-calorie and high-volume foods to create a feeling of fullness to reduce overall calorie intake. This strategy allows you to eat a larger volume of food without consuming excessive calories. You prioritize foods that are high in water content, fiber and nutrients, which tend to be lower in calorie density, such as fruit, vegetables and lean proteins. Focusing on nutrient-dense whole food help keeps you feel full and satisfied for longer since these foods quite literally fill up your stomach more. Of course, don't gorge on the broccoli if you don't like it, but find some food in these categories that you like and double down on those. Nutrition labels. 
visual appearance alone may not always reveal the protein or fiber content of a food, so it is important to learn how to read nutrition labels. Food and nutrition labels might have an important function in communicating nutrition information and can have considerable potential to influence food choices and dietary behavior. Most pre-packed foods have a nutritional information label on the back or the side of the packaging. By understanding the nutritional content of the foods, we can better manage their calorie intake, monitor macronutrient ratios and ensure a balanced diet. It's smart to pay attention to the serving size, calorie content, fiber and protein content and also added sugars. Portion control. Next up is portion control. Portion size is a key environmental driver of energy intake and larger than appropriate portion sizes could increase the risk of weight gain. Although a direct causal link between portion size and obesity remains to be established, advice to moderate portion sizes, especially of energy-dense food, is presently the cornerstone of most weight management advice. Monitoring portion sizes can contribute to caloric reduction. Portion control can be accomplished in a variety of different ways, including using smaller packages of food containing a defined amount of energy, portion controlled utensils where food is delivered in specific serving sizes or other visual cues such as smaller plates and bowls. All of these can help individuals manage portion sizes effectively and prevent overeating. You can also use healthy plate model for portion guidance. Fill half of your plate with vegetables, one quarter with lean protein sources, and the remaining quarter with whole grains or starchy vegetables, while you get your fat from cooking oil or fatty fish or with a sprinkle of parmesan cheese. Healthy plate model can promote portion control and a well-rounded nutrient profile, but ratios of nutrient on a plate, of course, can be adjusted to your specific needs, number of meals per day, etc. Hands as a serving guide can also help you with portion control where different food groups correspond to parts of your hands. Palm-sized portions for high-protein foods, fist-sized portion for carbs, cupped ham portion for veggies and thumb size portion for fats. It is also helpful to check serving sizes on packaged foods and sometimes downsize your dishes. Well, certain parts of it, as the veggies, fruits and proteins, usually aren't the problem. You could also weigh or measure certain foods to keep your serving size in check. Mindful eating. Strategy we cannot miss is mindful eating. Practicing mindful eating involves paying attention to physical hunger and fullness cues, eating slowly and savoring each bite. It is important to take your time with the meal and engage in all senses and chew slowly. Focus on your meal and not on the television or your phone and other distractions. Notice how the food looks, tastes, smells and feels in our bodies as we eat. Although the goal of mindful eating isn't a weight loss per se, but change in eating behavior, research suggests that it can lead to reduced caloric intake, increased satisfaction and improved dietary quality. Mindful eating could be an additional component to your weight loss journey. Food diary. Food diary is another greater strategy when trying to achieve calorie deficit. In the diary, you write down everything you eat and drink in a day. It can be particularly useful in identifying unhealthy eating patterns or habits, such as snacking on junk food in the evenings or overeating at meals, which are not helpful when trying to achieve a calorie deficit. Once you recognize those problems, you can address it with using other strategies. You can go old school with pen and paper or use online nutrition trackers. Physical activity. Lastly, we cannot forget about regular physical activity. It's not a nutrition strategy, but is it important part of weight loss process. 
Exercise has many health benefits, both physically and mentally, as it can improve nearly every aspect of our health. But the truth is that exercise alone, for most, does not guarantee successful weight loss. It is very difficult to create a calorie deficit just by exercising, as it would require a tremendous amount of effort. Plus, we overestimate energy expenditure during exercise. Also, the introduction of a heavy exercise regime can lead to other compensatory mechanisms such as increased hunger, fatigue and lower energy expenditure for other daily activities. Therefore, it is important to focus on your diet and creating a deficit through dietary changes, but also be active as the proper exercise helps your overall health and yes, you will probably burn some additional calories, but let's reframe our thinking of exercise. In the realm of weight loss, both cardio, aerobic exercise and resistance training, strength training, offer distinct advantages. Cardiovascular exercises like swimming or cycling improve overall health, from your heart health to your cognitive health. They are also effective for burning calories, furthering calorie deficit. However, relying solely on cardio may lead to greater muscle loss. On the other hand, resistance training involving weights or resistance bands play a significant role in preserving clean muscle mass, the loss of which happens during weight loss process. Muscle mass is crucial for healthy aging and sustainability of weight after weight loss as more muscle contributes to a higher resting metabolic rate, aiding to long-term weight management. So, a comprehensive approach that combines both cardio and resistance training is often recommended for weight loss process. But in the beginning of your process, don't sweat over what type of exercise to choose. Just sweat. With whatever exercise you feel like and enjoy even its slightest, but most importantly, see yourself doing over the next months and years. Meal planning. Lastly, there is meal planning and prepping your food in advance. Meal planning could be a potential tool to offset time scarcity and therefore encourage home meal preparation, which has been linked with an approved diet quality. Meal planning can be a real life changer as it can simplify the meal prep process, save you time and possibly money. You could decide to batch cook on the weekends and store and froze some of your meals, or you could prepare your food daily. Pick up some easy recipes that incorporate lean proteins, vegetables, and other nutrients, and then write down your shopping list. Don't forget to buy fresh or frozen veggies and fruit and snacks that support your goal. Try not to go shop hungry as there is a possibility that you will buy that extra chocolate as you will be more prone to high energy food items because of your hunger. Also, if you don't plan to eat it, don't buy it. If you have your pantry filled with delicious cookies and other high calorie snacks, you are essentially testing your willpower. Instead, create an environment that supports your goals and not the other way around. Bonus strategies. Certainly, there are numerous additional strategies for effectively achieving a calorie deficit that we didn't have time to cover in this video. For instance, proper hydration and drinking water before meals, cooking meals at home and preparing your own food as you know what goes into it, requesting sauces on the side when dining out, sharing meals, practicing mindful snacking, addressing emotional eating, prioritizing quality sleep, and so much more. Rest assured, we will explore these topics in future videos to provide you with even more comprehensive understanding of all the things and tools at your disposal for successful weight loss. But keep in mind, there is no single best strategy for weight loss as they usually work in union and they work in quiet, day by day. But small steps lead to big changes. And changes are hard. So, let's ask ourselves the final question. Why is it so hard to lose weight and keep it off? So, 
Finally, we have to address the burning question. Why is it so hard to lose weight and keep it off? Well, it's not just one thing. Long-term weight management is extremely challenging due to interactions between our biology, behavior, and the obesogenic environment. There is an industrialization of the food system that involves increased production and marketing of highly processed foods that have superhero appetitive properties and are usually more calorically dense. Fewer people prepare meals at home and more food is consumed in restaurants or on the go. In addition, occupation and mobilization became more sedentary. Then there are psychological and endocrine responses to weight loss ranging from appetite, satiety and changes in total daily energy expenditure. As the scientific literature has continuously shown, weight loss attempts do not always follow a linear fashion nor always go as expected even when the intervention is calculated with precise tools. One of the main reasons why this tends to happen relies on our body's biological drive to regain the body mass we lost to survive. Yes, you heard it right. Our body's survival mechanism don't want us to lose weight. This phenomena has been referred to as metabolic adaptation or adaptive thermogenesis many times in the literature, and although it is a controversial issue in the obesity fields, it plays a relevant role in the weight loss process. Metabolic adaptation describes a collection of responses by our body in reaction to weight loss. During your weight loss process, there will be a reduction in your TDEE, which is normal and expected since it depends on the total mass. Since you lose some weight, you will be lighter and there is less of you to maintain. Usually, you will need to adjust your caloric intake further to continue to lose weight, so it is wise not to start low with your deficit. But metabolic adaptation says that there will be even greater reduction in total daily energy expenditure than predicted or expected based on calculations due to dynamic changes in human energy balance. Another nice thing that happens due to metabolic adaptations are hormonal changes that influence food intake. Weight loss is accompanied by persistent endocrine adaptations that increase appetite and decrease satiety, thereby resisting continued weight loss and promoting weight gain. So yes, you'll start feeling even more hungry, less satiated after a meal, and some, more than others, hangry. <laughs> These appetite changes can really play an important role in explaining weight loss plateaus and weight regain. It has been estimated that for each kilogram of lost weight, calorie expenditure decreases by about 20 to 30 calories a day, whereas appetite increases by about 100 calories a day above the baseline level prior to weight loss. So no, we aren't lazy or lacking willpower. We are warriors battling our own biology. The severity of these changes will depend on the duration of the dieting period, where longer duration will increase those adaptation, the magnitude of the energy deficit, where higher deficit will promote larger responses, and previous body composition, where lower body fat levels before the intervention will resort in more drastic metabolic adaptation. There are some hypotheses to why these adaptations develop, but it all comes down to our prehistoric biology when food was scarce. But let's end on a more optimistic note. Research suggests that we can counter these changes with dietary strategies we discussed earlier. A gradual reduction in calorie intake, a diet rich in both high protein and high fiber foods, regular exercise, and consistency. And some researchers also conclude that this adaptation is not as big as we thought initially. Additionally, it is important to approach the weight loss journey holistically, celebrating small victories and focusing on overall health benefits 
rather than fixating solely on the number on the scale. And that's a wrap on the science behind weight loss. We really covered a lot of ground here, diving deep into the intricacies of energy balance, calorie deficit, and the fascinating world of weight loss. I hope your brain isn't feeling too calorie deficient from all the information we've packed in. Now that you got your science down, it's time to put into action and show those extra pounds who's the boss. Remember, weight loss is like a marathon except without or with the actual running. It's a journey that requires patience, perseverance, and it's more than just the numbers on the scale. It's about celebrating the small victories along the way, building healthy habits, and enjoying the process. Laugh at the occasional slip-up, embrace your food cravings in moderation, and remember that progress comes in many forms. Maybe it's just dropping a dress size, or perhaps it's just being able to finally do that extra push-up without collapsing. Thank you for joining me in this video and stay tuned for more exciting content where we will continue unraveling the nutrition mysteries one calorie at a time. Please like, comment and subscribe if you like this video and want to join our tribe of weight loss warriors. Now it's time to put that newfound knowledge into action and like in many things in life, to win we have to lose. Bye and see you next time.